What is Spiritualism? by Mrs. Emma Hardinge. This question, if presented to any given number of persons unacquainted with the philosophy of Spiritualism, persons who have not given a patient, candid, and fair hearing to the plea which it puts in, would be answered in as many modes as there should be questioners addressed. One would respond, Spiritualism is the last form of modern infidelity, one which subverts religion, aims destruction to the church, throws away the scriptures, denounces all that has been held sacred to the human heart. In a word, it is the latest invention of the enemy. Another would assure us that spiritualism is a profound imposture, the last delusion that has been imposed upon a credulous humanity. Another gravely asserts that spiritualism consists wholly in dancing tables, vibrating floors, and the tying of knots in ropes. Another, whilst acknowledging all the phenomenal evidences of an unseen agency, assures us it is affected by electricity, that electricity has learned to bring intelligence of hidden things, reveal the future and disclose the hidden mysteries of the past, and still another, that it is all animal magnetism or odd force. And such are the answers which many calling themselves reasonable men and women of the present day return in despite of the experience of millions of their fellow creatures, who assert that they, given to spiritualism a fair, candid, and patient investigation, know that it is a divine truth. We believe no persons, after having thus investigated spiritualism, have ever yet refused to acknowledge its claims. Spiritualism, if considered in its religious sense, belongs to no age, no country, no special class of mind. It is the acknowledgment of a spiritual origin of all things, the unfoldment of those mystic ties that binds the soul to its author. The opening of the page of that grand and occult revelation, which discloses to us the nature, quality, possible destiny, and absolute relations of the human soul to immortality. We do not therefore propose to speak of spiritualism in this grand and universal light tonight, simply of its speciality as a modern movement. In its universal sense, we should ask you to open the page of every religion that man has honoured since he has inhabited this globe, and bowed before the altars dedicated to religion, every one of which has been upreared on the faith of the spiritual revelation, underlying every form of religious belief. It is not to the general facts of this belief that we call your attention, but rather to that form of it, which has been scornfully denominated modern spiritualism, as if indeed spiritualism belonged to any age or any period. We invite you tonight to consider modern spiritualism in the two phases by which it is most commonly understood by investigators, namely the science of the phenomena and the deductions of the form of religious belief which may be drawn from it. Your speaker this night labours under this disadvantage in addressing you. She comes from a land where one-third of the population stands openly before mankind as the recorded advocates of spiritualism. In the great new world, 
eleven millions of persons of all classes, of all phases of thought, and capacities of understanding, are openly professed spiritualist, accustomed to speak of the philosophy which grows out of the phenomena, rather than the mere ABC which forms the groundwork on which the doctrine is based. We must address you as though you were for the first time entering upon the investigation and to point to the various methods by which yourselves may arrive at an understanding of what spiritualism is. There is a phenomenal phase and a doctrinal phase of this belief. The phenomenal phase assumes that you accept of the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, that you realize the possibility that the spirits of the beloved those whom you speak of as lost, departed, gone, are still in being, and that they can commune with you under prepared conditions. The simplest forms of the telegraphy are wrapping and movements of ponderable bodies. We know that the subject appears very undignified, but after what fashion would you propose to send the messages of kings, Kaisers, parliaments, and congresses, whose words of destiny may determine the fate of kingdoms and dynasties. You deign to accept the agency of a few plates of copper and zinc, and do not consider the means as too undignified. The tiny tap-tap of the magnetic operator and the postal arrangements that are so popular with yourselves are only the same methods by which the soul disembodied telegraphs to the soul embodied. Disabuse your minds for a few minutes of the unreasoning scorn and ridicule with which you treat the spiritual telegraphy and attempt to realize the fact that by using the self-same forces of the telegraph, worked by vital instead of mineral electricity, you will produce the wraps by which the telegraphic message of the soul is rendered. Various ponderable bodies, the movements of which are significant, are used as signs of the mind of the operator at the other end of the spiritual telegraphic wire. Another method is the employment of spiritual magnetism. The spiritual magnetizer first brings his magnetism to bear upon his subject, controls the senses either by entrancement, somnambulism, or in other ways familiar in experiments with human magnetism. The subject now pours forth the thoughts of the spirit through speech, or in writing, drawing, musical performances, or in autographic pantomime, all of which are displayed at the will of the invisible psychologist. There are many other modes by which the telegraph is worked, and many other phases by which spirit controls human subjects and ponderable matter. It is obvious, also, that there are powers of the human spirit itself, which have become unfolded by the magnetic process now in operation throughout the world. Powers which have long lain dormant, in humanity, or only become revealed from time to time in exceptional persons. These latent powers of the soul are often mistaken by mediums for spirit control. The result is that investigators of a superficial character, who merely discern the incidental phenomena of the movement, claim that electrobiology magnetism, or the action of mind upon mind, will account for all the phenomena. I shall, however, show you, ere we close, that these powers of the soul, though belonging to all and each of you, 
and capable, under favourable circumstances, of becoming developed, do not cover the ground occupied by spiritualism, or the control of spirits, for it is the operation of mind from the spirit world which constitutes the phenomena of what is called spiritualism. Meanwhile, we claim that spiritualism is a science, for though it is unknown in its working, it is as thoroughly a part of mental science as electricity is a portion of physical science, however imperfectly understood. But the phenomena of modern spiritualism are but the alphabet, the mere letters which constitute the sublime words which spell out immortality. They are no more immortality itself than the wild winds which sound in your ears are the infinite mind, whose power speaks through them. You may as well claim that the voices of the breeze that stir the treetops, or shout in the hoarse blast of the storm, are the majesty which rules them, as pretend that the mere phenomena constitute the whole of spiritualism. Each one is a sign merely, the action of the power that manifests itself as surely as the sand grain, as in the grand procession of words that spangle the heavens above you. The infinite mind marks itself in the microscope in the telescope beneath our feet, as in the lowliest blade of grass, or in the eternal blazonry of the starlit skies. We now invite your attention to some of the deductions which grow out of the phenomena of spiritualism. In Europe we find its investigation has scarcely advanced beyond its mere phenomena, you will pardon us, therefore, for quoting the experiences of those who in far greater numbers, and certainly with more earnestness of purpose, have searched beyond the mere experiments of the hour, and have drawn deductions from it. The first step in the investigation of spiritualism is to determine the identity of the communicating power or intelligence. We know it is common for some mediums to assert that the manifestations proceed from those whose names were time-honoured in the role of history, and therefore to cite those great names as authority for their communications. On this point we have naught to say except to express our hope that great minds, though passed from the sphere of their earthly career, are now ministering spirits no less interested in the earth they once trod than he, the father of spirits, who we constantly assert in our religious teachings is ever present with us. It is fair to infer that if this earth is not too unworthy as an abode for the infinite majesty who fills all worlds it is not too undignified for his ministering spirits to operate upon. We pray that the mighty God of suns and systems will take note of the smallest affairs of our earthly career. We may well assume, then, that the souls of those patriots who died for their country, the martyrs who burned for it, the friends and kindred, whom God has given us as most near and dear to our hearts, have not forgotten the earth they once trod on, the friends they once loved, and therefore we assume the possibility that the mighty dead may still operate at the wires of the telegraph, and constitute that host of ministering spirits of whom the Apostle Paul writes. Nevertheless, in the first investigation of spiritualism, it is necessary that we should first search for the test facts of identity, by thus carefully guarding the first footsteps of our investigation 
we determined that the friends who left us, whom we knew and trusted in life, are still about us. The inference is that if the spirit who passed from our home but yesterday can return, and through telegraphic signs assure us of his presence, others of that mighty host gathered up in God's eternal harvest grounds are partakers of the same law. Therefore, it is the first phases of modern spiritualism on the continent of America were purely confined to the test facts of the presence and identity of those whom the investigator could recognize by well-known signs, and thus become assured of the fact that spirits still live. The question that immediately follows is how and where does the spirit dwell? Then arises a solemn utterance of the spirit Samuel. Tomorrow thou and thy sons shall be with me. Ay, but where is that realm of the eternal to be? Let us question the spirit, if it is with the father whom I loved and trusted, if it is the friend who would not deceive me, if it is the spirit of those who I would take on earth as evidence, surely they would not deceive me now in their reply, though there should be this night upon every portion of this globe thousands of spirit circles for communication with spirits. The answer to this question in every country, through every form of mediumistic intelligence, however imperfect, shall always be corroborative. I am happy, or I am miserable, in precise proportion to what I did on earth. I have sown in the whirlwind, and I reap in the storm what I did in the body. Whatever life I myself engraved upon my spirit is now my sphere. Spiritualists have oft times heard the words of the preacher assuring them of the tribunal at which they will be judged, warning them that it was not the voice that cried, Lord, Lord, but the deeds which have been done in the body that will determine our hereafter. But coldly falls the echo of the preacher's voice when once its vibration ceased to sound in our ears. Back, back to the world we go, to cheat, deceive, and plunder each other through the legalized forms of trade and commerce, instead of preparing ourselves to render up even to the last farthing of the account which is to determine our future. We listen but it is a mere conventional act of the Sabbath-day reverence, and we pass from the place of prayer too often to mock it in our acts. When my noble father speaks, my brother, the brother with whom I have held sweet companionship, the mother who never deceived me, the friend whom I loved and trusted, when these commune with me in the spirit circle, when they in the garments wrought by their own acts, in spheres of happiness or misery formed by their deeds, appear before us, we must rise from the investigation convinced that we too are making our heaven or hell. We know that we are not working for tomorrow, but for eternity and the true spiritualist quits the spirit circle another and a better man. There is then a philosophy that grows out of this doctrine of spiritualism, which ramifies and appeals to every man's spiritual welfare. In the land of America, where spirit communications are received through great variety of means and media, 
there is also a strict analysis of the various acts and deeds which bear upon the spirit, and thus spiritualism is instrumental in promoting every kind of reform which bears upon purer and nobler lives. Spiritualism becomes a living, vital religion. Start not at the word religion, with spiritualism is not a mere Sabbath day affair. Religion with them, whilst it honours the Sabbath day, seeks for seven Sabbaths instead of one, demands that every place shall be a church as well as the house that man has consecrated to the name of the All-Father. Spiritualism requires every deed shall be an act of prayer, and every thought a form of worship. We shall now proceed to anticipate a few of those questions which are constantly urged as to what is the use of spiritualism. How often do we hear it said, assuming that all you claim for spiritualism is true, what is the use of it? Also, assuming that all you believe is founded on due evidence, by what means are we to arrive at similar convictions? How shall we believe, and by what means can we share in the knowledge which you possess? These are some of the questions which are commonly propounded and which we shall now endeavour to respond to. First, as to testimony, I would remind you that every religious sect registers its belief in ancient, if not in modern, spiritualism. No person who is religious, whether he worships at the shrine of Buddha or bows down before the name of Jehovah, but worships on the faith of a spiritual revelation. In fact, after whatever form you conduct the services of your religion, it is upon the faith of a spiritual revelation. You are therefore accepted spiritualists and believers in ancient, if not in modern spiritualism. But why not in modern spiritualism also? When has revelation ceased? When has the Lord's arm been shortened? When have the laws which he has instituted ages past been annulled or ceased from their operations in the grand procession of ages? The same stars shine upon you this night, which were lit up in centuries past. The same starry worlds shine on you, which lit the universe ere yours was born. There has been no cessation, but one perpetual and grand administration of God's majestic laws ever repeating. My ways are equal, O Israel. It is your ways that are unequal. We claim that the concurrent testimony of millions of living witnesses proclaim the truths of spiritualism. Millions of persons now live on the continent of America, who twenty years ago knew not even the name of spiritualism are now spiritualists upon the faith of accepted facts, and believe that the spirits which have passed away from the earth revisit it again. Such testimony as this is too mighty for the few utterly to ignore. Spiritualism has no special revelations to any highly favoured ones, and although dependent upon special conditions, these are possible to the whole human race. It has been found that any given number of persons meeting together and patiently waiting for the operation of the Spirit upon one another of their members 
manifestations or tokens of spirit presences are invariably developed amongst them. The methods used through the spirit circle to produce manifestations are open to each and all of you. We could no more produce to you the phenomena of atmospheric electricity than we could render to you the facts of spiritual manifestation, except under prepared conditions. These conditions are the presence of persons either known to be mediumistic or possessed of that mental and physical character which can be developed into mediumship. Here, therefore, is a field of investigation open to you all that presents you with an array of facts in which you can all share. Our witnesses are the wise and ignorant alike, every grade of life, every class, every condition, the happy, the sorrowful, and the joyful. All these, by using the simple dictates of reason, by bringing to bear the simplest forms of common sense upon the investigation, have determined the truth of spiritualism. It is something too much, even were spiritualism a mere transatlantic movement, to denounce eleven millions of your fellow creatures as rogues or fools, because they believe what they have investigated, and perhaps you have not. I shall now proceed to answer the oft-repeated question, what is the use of spiritualism? O mothers, if any there be present who have seen the light of thy house go out, who have seen the bright star quenched, that was lighted in thine arms, O mother, thou who hast seen the rosy cheek grow pale, and the violet eye grow dull, and the little pattering feet, the sound of which was music in thine ear, come no more. Hast thou asked what is the use of spiritualism? When the empty cradle is filled again by the precious presence of the living angel, Hast thou asked the use of spiritualism? When the rosy, joyous form of thy beloved one glances athwart thy spiritual vision, or the well-remembered token, even though it be but the old lisping accents of infancy tells thee thy child still lives, that all is well with the babe, that in a brighter and better land the unfolded blossom is grown from the bud into the loveliness of immortality. Thou dost not ask, what is the use of spiritualism? O widow who has walked the cold world alone, thy strong companion gone, the arm that supported thee powerless, the world once so bright with him, now so empty for thee. The star gone out, which thou mayest never, never again hope to see lighted. Gone, gone into the great mystery of the tomb. Gone into the dim unknown, gone thou knowest not where, and leaving thee alone. Widow, thou who hast heard the telegraphic sound that gives thee the assurance he still lives, that he is even wiser, stronger, better, and holier friend than thine earthly love, that he is by thy side, thy ministering angel, that he who has left thy mortal sight is still, by God's providence thy guardian angel still. Thou dost not ask what is the use of spiritualism. We ask not the question in the day of sorrow. We ask it not in the day of trial, nor on the battlefield when the patriot leader is no more, or in the state when the mighty man that guided the helm has disappeared. We ask it not when we know 
that in the councils of a brighter and better land the mighty dead still carry out the appointed purposes of their rudimental life on earth, and are all its ministering spirits. We cannot ask it when we see the hosts of spiritualists whom the glad tidings of this gospel of immortality have lifted up from mourning to rejoicing, from reckless vice to watchful virtue, from human weakness into inspired strength, from a terror-stricken race fleeing from the shadow of the dread death angel to the triumphant victory over death and sin. Spiritualism teaches that this earth is but the first stage of human existence, the rudimental sphere, the schoolhouse, where science, knowledge, learning, love, and all the powers of the human being must first bud, to ripen in the higher, nobler life. It teaches that having exhausted all our forms of material science, and trod the various realms of knowledge and learning that matter informs us of, we stand before the shrine of the closed gates of mind, baffled by the very soul which enables us to investigate material forms. Then, having exhausted all the knowledge that earth can give, we soar upwards through spiritualism to penetrate the mystery of the future, and no longer stand confounded and abashed before the power of mind. We take the telescope in hand, and trace back the footprints of the Creator, through the millions of years gone by, pierce His purpose, and read the destiny of His shining army of world's millions of years to come. But the mind that enables us to do this, the power by which we investigate this magnificent page of an almost bondless eternity we are ignorant of. This is the dawn of the day of mental science that opens up to us the profound mysteries of that grand and sublime power by which we master all things in creation, by which we achieve the sovereignty of earth, and spiritualism proves that that power may become our own, may become an open page for our investigation, to study it, to learn it, comprehend its meaning, its nature, and almost its very substance. What is the use of spiritualism? There be those who, after long and patient years of toil in material science, having discovered that that the soul still survives the shock of death, still exerts its energies, and performs the functions of mind in a higher and better world, have declared all their sciences worthless compared with this discovery which they have made. There are those, too, who have believed there might be some use in spiritualism when they have seen the substances which, according to the law of gravitation, ought to fall to the earth floating above it. There are those who do deem such a phenomena worthy the investigation of the scientific mind. Granted it did not commend itself to the religious world, granted there was something too material for the piety of the very pious in spirits who rap on floors and cause tables to dance and ponderable bodies to vibrate there might be to the transcendentalist something too undignified in the action of spirits performing such acts but still spiritualism appeals to the scientific mind requiring some explanation at the hands of great and learned savants. It cannot be too undignified for you to investigate, as long as there are any 
who are too ignorant to explain it. Tell us the modus operandi, and we will abandon all claims for it being a science. The cry of imposture it is too late to utter. In the presence of millions who, by faithful investigation, have changed that cry into the assurance that spiritualism is a truth. Besides, it is uttered only in ignorance, never in knowledge. Spiritualism is a fixed fact. We have seen it growing up like flowers beneath our feet. We have seen it in the land of the far west, in the camp of the miner, when the worst passions fostered by the demon of gold were subdued by the tremendous fact of individual responsibility forced upon the startled and astonished soul, drew the communications of spirits. We have seen it in the home of the drunkard, in the man who was deaf to the voice of the preacher, with which he had become familiar until he had despised and neglected it. We have seen it awakening man to the dreadful realization that crime was to be engraven forever not upon the earthly form, but upon the living spirit. We have seen it in the heart of anger, keeping back the angry word and restraining the hasty blow with the assurance which it brought that there was a gentle mother, a tender sister, a loving wife, though invisible to the mortal eye, yet ever present, that there was a reality in the assertion of a cloud of witnesses about mankind. We have seen it amongst millions of our fellow creatures who, with all their faults and failings, have become better men and better women from the assurance that retribution would be demanded from them for their acts and deeds. Spiritualism is a living fact that appeals to every one of us through the senses. It is reality which forces itself upon the investigator by its stubborn facts. It does not require you to believe on another's witness. It asks you to look abroad and remember if it be a delusion that millions of your fellow creatures are this day overwhelmed by it and you ought to give them as strong a reason for renouncing it as those which made them spiritualists. Why do you fear it? Nought can smite the rock which is not harder than the rock. Can you destroy the mighty with the weak? Can you subvert God's truth with falsehood? Surely God the good is stronger than the false or evil. The same power which inspired the utterances of prophets gave strength to apostles, comfort and solace to martyrs in days gone by, exists in every age, and now appeals to the spiritualists in the form of science and the ministry of beloved spirits, assuring him that when the death angel summons him away, he goes to the place which his own acts have prepared for him. He goes with the assurance that the form which he lays down, the garments of clay which he casts off, is not the real man, but that the spirit which is wrought within that tenement is the immortal part, and will survive the shock of death, and become whatsoever himself has made with it. With this assurance, every spiritualist quits this earth, and happy it is for those who have heard the tidings that prepare them for the inevitable results of earthly life. There are thousands who have passed from the battlefields of blood-stained America. There are thousands who, within the last short score of years, have left their mortal forms with the glad and rejoicing tones of those who were going from darkness into light, from the land of strangers 
to their home. There are voices even this hour, repeating in many a spirit circle the glorious assurances that there shall be no more death, and in the certainty which spiritualism has brought that there is consolation for all, hope for all. There are those who, gazing into the scenes of despair and suffering presented in our cities, and realizing the voices from the spirit land, which have sounded in glad anthems eternal progress, hope, consolation, fatherly care for all, fear not even for the lowest of God's creatures. They know that the law which ages past unfolded lovely blossoms out of the old crude materials of primeval existence will convert these rough and unwrought life elements into thrice refined gold. What is the use of spiritualism? It brings hope to the mourner, joy to the sorrowful, strength to the weak, consolation to the desolate, victory over death, the assurance of immortal life and the triumphant conviction that the soul lives for ever, and that it progresses from one eternity to another. And these are but some of the crude outlines of the general question, what is spiritualism? Tomorrow night we propose to speak more in detail of its peculiar phenomena as related to ancient spiritualism. Think not, however, our subject could be exhausted with your patience or your speaker's strength. Think not that in so hasty a review as this we can exhaust the question, what is spiritualism? We can merely assure you it is neither the folly, imposture, or deception that has been too often represented to you. It is a fixed fact of the nineteenth century. It is based upon those foundations of eternal sciences that are derived from the God who laid the foundations of science in eternal law, based on immutable principles. We claim, therefore, for spiritualism that it is a science although but a rudimental one. We claim it as one of the grandest revelations and most sacred facts of religion, and we dare to affirm from the dual aspect that it thus presents itself in, that its mission is to prove a religious science and establish a scientific religion for all mankind.